Let's find common ground. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Florian Glatz, founder of Common Ground. And in this podcast, we talk to Francesco Renzi, the founder of Superfluid. Super excited to have you here. Hi, Francesco. Hey, thanks for the invite. Amazing to be here. Very, very excited. Same. Um, please introduce yourself quickly for our listeners who don't know you yet. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Francesco. I'm uh, one of the founders of Superfluids. We are an asset streaming protocol deployed on uh, eight different EVM uh, networks. Uh, using Superfluid, you can send streams of uh, pretty much any ERC-20. And uh, a lot of people are building some really cool stuff on top of us. Uh, I've been in the space for about five years. And yeah, that that's about it. Before we dive deeper into Superfluid, uh, I agree with you. It's a really awesome uh, application or protocol rather that uh, serves application, uh, also common ground, hopefully in the future. Uh, I want to uh, understand a little bit how you actually got into Web3. Uh, we have a bunch of listeners who are sort of, you know, thinking about getting into it. So maybe you can share your own story in a few words. So this sounds like a trap. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm basically, I, I just moved to Estonia and Estonia is this kind of digital country, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of tech startups there. And, uh, I just moved there second day there. I decided to go to a cryptocurrency, uh, meetup, right? This was 2017, uh, in the autumn, you know, everybody was, I, I remember I walk into the room and I see everybody's laptops and everybody's got these countdowns. Right. I don't know if you remember, but it was like a period where ICOs did countdowns, right? That there was a countdown and then you had to go and throw your money into the ICO. Uh, so there were all these countdowns. Everybody was super excited about, you know, tokens pumping and stuff like that. And, uh, the meetup, you know, was full of people trying to sell rubbish basically, uh, in terms of, you know, bad investments. But then there was one uh, presentation that was really good by this German lawyer who I'm not going to name. And, uh, that presentation was really, really, really inspiring. I remember at the end, I asked him some, uh, for some projects that he would recommend me to, to check out. He mentioned Kleros, uh, I think true, true bit, uh, you know, some of the more kind of crypto economically secured protocols, right? So it got me down that rabbit hole and, uh, and then I, I got a job, uh, and had the luxury to kind of, uh, sit around and learn for a long time, uh, eventually started uh, coding as well, not very well, but kind of enough to understand how to build stuff. And then uh, started to build stuff with uh, my current CTO and eventually landed on Superfluid. Uh, so yeah, Florian was the lawyer at the meetup. So <laughs> that's how we met uh, in 2017. <laughs> and yeah, it's been a wild ride since, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing because honestly, no one else at that meetup was impressive in any way. <laughs> so if, if it weren't for, uh, your presentation, I probably would have uh, thought there was, you know, just a bunch of gamblers because that's basically what it was like. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the people who stick around in the bear markets are people who see past the gambling veneer, right, of crypto. Um, and that's kind of uh, something that, you know, I, I personally feel like I owe you. Well, um, I'm, you know, I love the story. So thank you for sharing it. And, um, yeah, it was amazing back then in Estonia. I was giving uh, actually lectures in Tartu to some IT slash law students. And then I went to uh, Tallinn to speak at this meetup and meet some people. And so I'm very happy to hear that, you know, um, sometimes I, re I reach people who then actually get inspired and then become such an amazing founder like you. I, it's, you know, makes it all worth it. So thank you for sharing. Since you're now the founder of a Web3 company, um, how much are you actually using Web3 products in your day-to-day -day life? Um, and feel free to say none if that's, you know, hey. the reality or, you know, name us a few that you think uh, are already enriching your life. Uh, the background of the question is, of course, trying to understand how far are we in this Web3 revolution? Are we actually at a point yet where Web3 helps people in their everyday life? How is it with yeah, you personally? I, I think that's a really good question, right? And there's a couple of things that are uh, interesting. The truth is most of crypto right now is still financially oriented and I don't touch any financial app that often, right? I'm not a gambler. I'm not a trader. Like I don't, I don't trade. I don't need to buy or sell stuff every day. Right? So you could argue that I use crypto as much as I use fiat or fintechs, right? Uh, that said, I do use crypto quite often, uh, for angel investments. 
I use crypto. I, I mean, I get my salary in crypto and streams, right? But uh, and that happens every every second. So technically, I'm always using crypto. Uh, but uh, I I don't actually have to do anything because the streams just run on their own, right? So you know, it kind of depends how you how you define um, how you define using Web three. I'd say one of the apps I probably use the most often, which is associated to my wallet, is Lens. Uh, I think Lens is really cool. Use that quite often. And I do spend quite a lot of time um, testing all sorts of stuff that's being built on Superfluid. So any application that that's built on us, you know, I'll connect my wallet, test it, and you know, give some feedback to the founders. I do that quite often. So, yeah, I mean, I I, I think I I could probably use it more, but I definitely feel like I use it quite often. Uh, I love the answer. It's very honest, but also shows that there are real applications uh, for Web3 crypto today. It's basically mostly financial, but you also mentioned Lens, which is a decentralized social graph protocol that allows people to have sort of a Web3 identity. And then there are applications connecting to this identity. Um, there are apps like Twitter. There are other kinds of apps where you can basically have a sort of social experience that uses Web3 identities. And at Common Ground, we're in fact also going to integrate the Lens social graph because it's as such an obvious, uh, you know, um, utility that is provided um, with these on-chain social graphs that we want to use them as well. Um, so yeah, um, I like your answer. Thank you so much. And um, maybe a last question on this Web3 adoption topic. Um, we're all in the crypto space currently looking, I think, quite enviously at the AI people. You know, they were like, for years, AI was like this, yeah, okay, AI, but you know, what, what can you do with it? What, like, who has <laughs> access to this? You know, it's like this dark magic. And now there's ChatGPT and, I don't know, a million startups based on ChatGPT. Um, and uh, Satya Nadella, the, the Microsoft CEO, recently was quoted in, in having said that uh, blockchain needs its chat GPT moment. Uh, do you have any yeah. prediction or gut feeling? What will be Web3's chat GPT moment? That's such a good question. I actually posed the same question to my team uh, just a few days ago and the, more, more in terms of uh, superfluid. So the way I think of it is actually OpenAI is actually, or GPT has been around for a while, but then chat GPT made it so accessible that everybody could go and, you know, write something, screenshot it, tweet it, right. And that kind of exploded GPT, but GPT has actually been around for a tight, you know, a bit longer, right. So if you think of kind of GPT as the protocol, chat GPT as the first real app, right. And it's kind of the killer app maybe, or maybe it was just the first app, right. Um, then for web free, I think it's, uh, most likely going to be something social, I think something that had, because ultimately it's all about virality, right? Like it's all about like the only reason we know about this AI stuff is because it, it lends itself very well to, to being shared and, you know, talked about, uh, so I hope it's something more interesting than monkey pictures. Um, yeah. it did look like we had a, you know, a, I first go at a bit of the kind of mainstream adoption with the monkey pictures, but hopefully the next, uh, the next round, something is slightly more, slightly less about money. Right. Um, cause I thought yeah, that yeah. was a, you know, you know, ultimately the kind of NFT culture doesn't really vibe with me because it's all about brandsy, you know, like I buy something, I show it off, you know, it's just like, I've never, yeah. I've never really vibed Social with that. Social status basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, because it's like. The problem with that kind of thing is that it, it works by being exclusive, right? And anything that works by being exclusive will never be, uh, fully like it, it by definition, not everybody can adopt it, right? Because no. the whole point is it's exclusive. Uh, so I think something that is more inclusive and probably lower friction, less uh, money oriented, like you don't need to spend money to become part of this new thing. Uh, will probably be what takes off, right? So it could be, it could be somebody figuring out how to make something like Lens fun, for example, uh, yeah. or you know, it could even be something like Worldcoin. As much as people hate it, and you know, I personally don't like the orb scanners either, but that kind of thing, you know, does have potential to onboard millions of people, right? Um, 
but I, I truly hope it's something um, that is related to, you know, the financial aspects of crypto. But at the same time, I don't think it's likely to be the case. I think it's much more likely yeah. to be something non-financial. Um, but we'll see. I, I don't have any good predictions. Ah, uh, those, but you gave some good sort of, uh, you know, points actually to make predictions on. And I think I would agree. I think there is a limit to how well finance sort of scales, socially speaking. I think a lot of people are just not interested in finance. They don't understand finance. Maybe they even think finance is evil, right? Because money is sort of ambiguous thing um, that can be great if you have it, but if you don't have it, you just, it feels like an oppressive force in, the, in this world. Yeah. Um, I I also feel like it it could be something in the social arena. Obviously, that's why we build common ground. That's why we want to make these social graphs on blockchain accessible, like the Lens protocol, uh -huh. but also just token contracts in general, right? Be it monkey picture tokens or be it governance tokens in DAOs, right? Those are all, in a sense, social graphs, which don't really have great applications yet to interact with them and interact with people that are part of this graph. So this is uh, this is sort of how we look at it at Common Ground. And maybe in the future, you know, it could be something uh, combined. So, I mean, we've talked about Superfluid, how we could integrate it at Common Ground. And what I really love is this idea of, you know, the stream that you've built, the stream protocol. And uh, what we want to do at, at Common Ground is really make the users the owners of the platform. And I think what inspired me in the conversation that we had is this idea that we could stream sort of the equity of the company to the users while they are using it. So using the app, bringing value to it, actually yeah. while you do it, you can see how you your share in, in ownership in this entity increases. I don't know if that yeah. is you know, has the potential to go viral, but it feels mind blowing to me that this is possible I, I, with your application. I, I I completely agree. I actually want to make maybe not not a prediction, but kind of a, an observation, right? That the kind of uh, long term objective is to have everyone use blockchain money, right? Blockchain for for money, for transactions, for all their assets, all that stuff. But the truth is that in order to do that, we need to onboard people to self custody. And we need to give everyone a blockchain address, right? But once you have that, then using crypto for more and more things becomes more obvious because I truly believe crypto actually has very good UX. Like the simplicity, like for me to send money to someone in the Philippines is really hard. I make a, I was making a, an angel investment in fiat and it got bounced twice by the bank, right? Like yeah. it is actually, like crypto actually has good UX. The problem is the onboarding. And... The, that's why I'm bullish on non-financial use cases, because if you onboard me to use an app that's fun, and then by using that app that's fun, maybe I earn some money or I earn an NFT Absolutely. that I can sell or some sort of value accrues to that yeah, yeah. wallet, then I've basically been onboarded without having to go through the painful steps of on-ramping money. Right, which is something that most people are never going to do. Right, like a somebody yeah. in a third world country will not put their savings into crypto. Right, like, uh -huh. but if you if you look at, for example, Axie Infinity, right, Axie Infinity onboarded uh -huh. millions of people in the Philippines who never had to on ramp because what they did is they joined the guild. The guild would give them some assets. They would play with those assets and earn more money. So they were using the blockchain to earn rather than using the blockchain to invest, right? And yeah. the truth is most people do not have capacity to invest. So yeah. if we expect, you know, to onboard billions of people for investment, when most of the people in the world have no money to invest, we're not going to go very far. But instead, if we create mechanisms for those people to adopt Web3 in a playful manner and earn before they're asked to spend, then I think we we have a shot at adoption, right? Which is one of the reasons why I'm so bullish on gaming. But I also think things, like you said, social applications where there are things you can do without spending anything. And then eventually by providing value, earn something are super, super valuable ultimately. And yeah, I mean, obviously that value should be streamed, but you know, don't need to talk my own book all the time. <laughs>
<laughs> no, this is genius. And actually, I've never looked at it, I think, in the way you just framed it, but it makes total sense to me that um, actually, I would agree with you, crypto has amazing UX once you're in the system, because literally the simplicity of exchanging value is unmatched by any other system of value transfer that we've ever seen in the history of humankind. But getting on RAM is really, really hard. And funny enough, now in the United States, they are shutting down the on ramps to crypto, right? So it's actually getting harder. Um, I've just read the news that major exchanges can't receive wire transfers anymore in the United States. They really want to make it hard. It sort of feels like the US is becoming like Argentina, where they want to make it hard to acquire, you know, to sell your local currency into another currency. And I mean, um, I think uh, for this reason, exactly this reason, um, people shouldn't have to on ramp uh, through, I don't know, bank accounts and exchanges. It should actually them bringing value to a system and being rewarded based on blockchain based value or coins uh, for bringing this value. Thank you for framing it that way. That even uh, gives me sort of uh, some ideas. That's really some cool. ideas. <laughs> um, yeah, so it is. <laughs> um, Let's talk about payments for a moment, because obviously Superfluid is broadly in this realm of payments. Um, uh -huh. I hope I'm not framing it wrong. Correct me. Correct me if I'm wrong. But that's that's how we, I say it. If we just say payments, I think the problem is true. But people also associate payments with uh, like something really boring. So I, I kind of want to say it's uh -huh. not just payments. Uh, and cool. payments are usually moving money. And Superfluid doesn't necessarily have to move money, right? Uh, we don't think of moving as other kinds of assets as payments, right? But Superfluid realistically can be used to to move any uh, ERC20 style fungible token, right? So it's not necessarily yeah, about yeah. payments as much as it is about moving fungible value uh, across the blockchain in um, kind of new and scalable ways. That's kind of, that no. would kind of be my, my definition. I actually uh, would would add that right now 80 percent no let's 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 say ether is money so 60 percent of our of our volumes are not uh money as much as we are about payments most of our volumes are not about uh money move they're about different kinds of tokens which you know the moneyness of those tokens is debatable it's so interesting and i i mean that's what i love about crypto conversations you just literally deconstruct any concept that you're <laughs> traditionally familiar with, like the moneyness of the assets. That's such a beautiful uh, framing. Um, what are non-payment related or non-money related things that people stream with uh, Superfluid? Um, I've seen on your website there a button that says vesting, for example, which seems yeah. really appealing. Uh, can you give us some examples and and uh, what, what people are doing with Superfluid? Yeah, so... Again, basically what Superfluid allows you to do is stream uh, any RC20 from one account to another. Uh, the stream is perpetual, happens every second. It happens without requiring the user to ever touch the blockchain. So the user opens the stream with one transaction, and then the stream just goes, right? So it's this kind of perpetual movement of funds, which is very fixed fixed in, in the way it works. Uh, and, but as a result, is is also very flexible. So for example, you can send and receive any number of streams at the same time. Those streams are netted between each other uh, in real time. So for example, as you receive your salary, you can send your salary somewhere else, right? So every second you receive it and send it at the same time and your account uh, doesn't accrue any money because it's kind of, you know, as it receives, it's sending uh, the money forward, right? And by doing that, you can, for example, uh, receive your salary in USDC, but reinvest it in real time into Ether. Right, so you can do these kinds of uh, pretty interesting things. So things super people are doing with superfluid vesting is a big one. That's obviously not um, a payment, right? Although it is kind of a payment, yeah. but it's not. It's not a payment. Depends on how you you look at those assets. Um, we have a pretty big contingent of users that uh, use streaming for dollar cost averaging. So as I described, yeah. you know, you you take your USDC and you stream it to this market, and the market will swap it for a different assets. Uh, so for example, USDC and you buy Ether or the opposite, right? Maybe you want to divest from Ether, so you will stream Ether and receive a USDC, right? So that's a pretty big contingent. 
And more recently, we've also started uh, building some integrations in gaming. And the ones in gaming yeah, are, are yeah. pretty exciting. So in gaming, yeah, yeah. Uh, imagine you have an in-game currency and you stream that to the game to get access to some uh, you know special features. In this specific case of the game we integrated most recently, you're basically renting land in the game by streaming the in-game yeah. asset. And by renting that land, you can then stake your NFTs on the land and earn yields. Uh, you know, there's a whole kind of game mechanic. But uh, with in-game assets, I get really excited because basically since we launched that integration, we got 25,000 users to, uh -huh. uh, to basically start streaming this in-game assets to this uh, contract in the matter of two days. And that just you know, doesn't, doesn't happen very often for us. Like, Dude. so we got very excited well. about that. And yeah. I started thinking more about gaming and ultimately my vision on, on web free gaming is that we we're building all this kind of financial and non-financial infrastructure around public private keys, you know, all this kind of really cool stuff. And we all have this vision of a future where everybody's using crypto for everything and all of your money is blockchain and you're using it for all your, uh, all the economies running on the blockchain, right? We all have this vision. But we, you know, when, you know, if you kind of drag us back to earth, we will all admit that it's probably about 20 years away, right? But if you look at an in-game economy, you can design that from scratch to completely use crypto, right? Like you can design a web-free game with a functional economy, with money moving from A to B to C to D to, you know, wherever, flowing around in different ways. And you can design that fully uh, on crypto rails, right? And that's what a lot of these on-chain web free games are doing. And as they redesign those economies, what I'm super excited to do is go in and say, Hey, you're designing a new web free economy. You should be using streams for all the things where streams make sense, right? So things like rentals, things like income, things like, uh, yields, you know, things like taxes, things like, you know, um, uh, subscriptions, all sorts of kind of recurring payments, you should be doing in streams, right? And uh, the truth is it, it clicks pretty well with game designers because, uh, you know, you want to have a novel engaging mechanic for your users to play with, right? And yeah. uh, it's very easy to build on chain because it's one function call, right? You have a token and then the same way you would do token transfer, you do token stream, right? It, it, it just works incredibly well and it's very simple to understand very simple to build with and as a result uh for example this this gaming integration i was talking about before with this game called planet ix it took us about a month to set it up including the contract the ui everything right and um yeah it's it, it's very exciting you know I, I think we're gonna start seeing a lot more games uh on-chain games because they're they're this way this this trojan horse to onboard users in a fun way, yeah. right? And then yeah. these people experience crypto in the best way, right? They're earning money instead of spending it, at least until the cost of the cards comes down, right? They're uh, learning how the self custody works. They get to interact with all these primitives. They get to understand how, you know, an NFT exchange works, how Uniswap works, how Superfluid works, you know, all of this to play a game, right? And yeah. that's the best way to learn anything. Right. Like, a, how did you learn to, how to use money by playing Monopoly? Right. It's and, the same thing. Right. And this is kind of the economy of the future that we're building. And instead of onboarding people in a high stakes environment where we ask them to put all their savings into Bitcoin and to only transact with on chain wallets, instead of doing that, we onboard people with super low stakes environment where they're playing a game moving around, you know, $20, basically occasionally, maybe they get to off ramp something and, you know, be happy about it. Uh, and in the meantime, they get to experience all these things and maybe something will stick, you know, maybe they will eventually I... move their savings into crypto. Maybe they will start thinking, Hey, maybe I should get paid every second that I work. You know, there's a lot of, uh, opportunities in my opinion. Right? There's even this uh, idea that I've heard um, uh, years ago already is that, um, you know, when you've designed a sophisticated in-game economy, at some point you can turn this in-game economy just into a real economy, right? Just like flipping a switch, right? It's been a game up until now, but suddenly it's not just a game anymore. The money or the assets from this game are suddenly, you know, real in a sense. And I think with crypto, 
that's always possible because every asset can be freely transferred. And so exactly. if there is a market for it, right, you can stop maybe paying your rent with it or I don't know. And, and you know, there are so many options. Um, but then maybe throwing a, a little wrench uh, in, in, in this in this vision. Um, <laughs> um, some some critics of of uh, the crypto future that we're envisioning are actually criticizing. I think exactly this element that gets us excited, which is this. They call it the hyper financialization of the world. Right. This this uh, vision where. Everything you do, you always have, you know, sort of a stream visible of some resource being taken away from you or you earning it. And everything suddenly becomes oriented on exactly those metrics. Um, we've seen, you know, some some awful, uh, I think, visions uh, presented by um, in, in one Black Mirror episode some years ago where everything is about social status, right? I see someone and then I immediately rate them. Those yeah. kinds of interactions. Um, do you ever think about this or is this something that you are, you know, concerned about that you are sort of, you know, uh, building? I mean, I find, I, I've tested hyperfluid, also uh, superfluid also with you and I find it, uh, it's so compelling to see how, you know, this amount increases. It's gamified in a deep, <laughs> deep way. And I think the human psychology is triggered by this. Are you uh, are you afraid sometimes that you're building sort of the, you know, the atomic bomb sort of, of no, hyper-financialization? No. Hyper I think, I actually think that that is a very flawed view. Um, like, it's not something I think about too often. So my, my thoughts on this might not be completely, uh, completely kind of the thought through. Uh, but generally speaking, I think there's a big divide between people with assets and people without assets, right? People without assets tend to rely on income. People with assets uh, generally, you know, have sufficient assets to not need to rely on income, right? And the truth is that what blockchain, what the blockchain technology does very well is creating new assets, right? When you uh, play a game and get an NFT, that is an asset, right? And most people never have assets. Like if you think of someone in a third world country, they work all their life for a minimum wage. They never have anything. They never have a house. They never have a car. They never have anything, right? Uh, they're literally living go, uh, what's the expression, hand to mouth, right? And what crypto does very well is creating assets. And I think creating assets is a way that helps people who otherwise don't have assets to achieve some semblance of uh, financial opportunity, right? Because assets are ultimately the way you achieve uh, financial freedom, right? In a very broad sense, right? Like uh, financial freedoms usually are oh, buy a house, you know, passive income, blah, 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 right? Those things are the only way you can achieve that is through assets, right? Now, I'm not saying that NFTs are going to save the world, right? But I do think that uh, allowing people to create smaller assets and reducing the friction that goes into making things of value and allowing people to have those and use them in a financial sense will allow for people to have greater access to finance. And, you know, you can call that hyper-financialization if you want, but if that's what you call it, then I think hyper-financialization is a great thing because you're basically giving people who never had access to finance, access to finance, right? While at the moment, access to finance is basically only for people who actually have things, right? Like if you, if, yeah. I, if I told you get a, get a loan, right? Yeah, sure. You, you have a house, you have a car, you, you know, you're, you're well off, you'll get a loan, right? But if you go and ask someone who only has an income to get a loan, they're going to, you know, if they're lucky, get a very bad loan, right? Um, so yeah. I think helping basically creating more assets allows more people to have assets and allowing more people to have assets allows more people to access uh, better loans because they have assets to secure those loans. As much as, you uh, know, again, it sounds aspirational to think that NFTs will turn into collateral that people can use to improve their lives. I truly believe that. And I think uh, it's, it's a very kind of privileged view to think that that is a joke or a game, right? Because we've uh, read the stories of people in the Philippines literally earning money from Axie Infinity, right? And what that mm -hmm. is, is literally a game producing assets out of nowhere 
which create wealth for people who would otherwise be less well off, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think if you extend that to more applications, you know, it could be games, it could be social apps, it could be, you know, maybe somebody starts earning appreciation points on some social app of the future, and that actually improves them their life, right? For whatever reason. So, you know, basically, I think hyper-financialization, if that's the name we want to use, is probably a good thing. And the people who are criticizing it haven't thought through the fact that the way rich people get rich is by having access to finance and hyper-financialization is giving that access to more people, which is probably that, a good thing. Uh, that's an interesting take. And I think I agree with uh, many things that you said. I think um, what you didn't really touch upon, but we don't have to go deeper into this, is this you know, psychological aspect of um, sort of hyper focus on finance right so oh, yeah. um is is the salvation a hyper focus on finance or is the fo is is the salvation in a sense to broaden access to financial opportunities right it, it's not necessarily the same thing um i would say right i i don't know i don't know as i said I ha it's not like something i've fought through too much uh yeah. i generally think it's yeah. gonna happen whatever we do so all we can do is kind of build the best tools and imbue them with some sort of values that we think are, are the right ones. Let's talk about a different topic, which uh, is top of mind for many people at the moment, which is security in Web3. Um, we've seen a major hack with Euler, uh, Euler, they call it. <laughs> Euler Finance recently, I think they lost, I don't know how many hundreds of millions uh, in a hack. I think some or all of the money was returned by now, which is great to hear. But overall, um, Web3 is still sort of, it has a reputation for uh, being hacked uh, one way or another. I think the last two years also gave a lot of evidence for that, uh, where people were able to exploit things. What is your perspective with, you know, building a protocol that is obviously touching sort of exactly those sensitive topics? Is there a solution to this problem of security? Or is it just, you know, trial and error? Um, do we do we need, I don't know, formal verification? Do we need insurance? What is the way forward to actually, you know, make Web3 so secure that we can tell literally millions of billions of people actually put your life, life savings on the blockchain? Uh, you have, you know, access to more opportunities that way. And there is not the downside of getting hacked. What's what's the a way forward there yeah that's that's honestly the hardest question um i'd say there's no wrong approach and it's always going to be a multi-pronged you know approach between things like formal verification auditing insurance you know everything you mentioned i think is has its own merits none of them work in isolation right so like a a holistic approach to security is is the only way but the truth yeah. is what I've seen so far is there's nothing you can do to completely sleep at night except for time passing. Like the only thing yeah. that seems to uh, show that something doesn't have any holes is just time passing and no leaks appearing. And yeah. that is a very hard thing to digest as a startup founder because you don't have the luxury of time, right? Like I can't wait two years before I let my users uh, be secure, right? So that's why so many people invest so much money in security because obviously you want to cut that time down. But I, you know, I personally think that all the industry has to do is survive long enough for that perception of security to improve. And the other thing that I think is very important and I hope, you know, as an industry we can... Uh, I always keep in mind is that the way things were solved in traditional finance are not going to work for us and we shouldn't uh, make the mistake of trying to adopt them. Uh, adopting security practices that worked for traditional finance is a shortcut that will not work. Uh, and just to give a couple of examples there, right? Let's say, for example, in, um, in payments, right? Which is something I, I kind of think more often about, right? Uh, the concept of a chargeback is basically this concept that I pay you, right, for something. 
but you don't get the money until a certain period has passed. And then if I change my mind, I can kind of take that money back and say it was a, a scam. And maybe it was a scam. But the point is, when I said I gave you money, I didn't actually give you money. Right? There's an intermediary. There's a lot of time wasted, a lot of capital inefficiency, a lot of, uh, you know, insecurity on your end. And uh, the worst part is that this intermediary also will penalize you if uh, there's a chargeback. So, you know, I've seen these crazy stories of, you know, a merchant getting a payment and then the payment getting charged back and the merchant having to pay a fine to the intermediary. So not only did they not make the money, but they also had to pay extra on top of that. And this is just a terrible system, right? It's like, it's obviously a terrible system because basically what it's giving is a ton of insecurity around everything. Um, while, you know, not necessarily solving the problem because it doesn't, um, there's no guarantee that the chargeback is not a grief, uh, a griefing attack from my end, right? Uh, so basically, and, and, you know, you listen to a podcast and there's these people that work in FinTech that are like, oh, crypto payments are never going to make it until we get chargebacks. Right. And that is just uh, so annoying. That's like a horse guy saying, oh, cars are never going to make it until they have better saddles. Right. And I'm like, you don't get the point, right? Uh, we have to develop better security practices rather than the same and security practices because the medium is different, right? The the way that technology works is different and the solutions are not going to look the same, right? And, and I'm not saying I have the answers. I'm just saying uh, adopting the same solutions is not going to work and is going to like and basically inherit. That's the thing, right? It inherits the slowness. So let's say we that, adopt chargebacks, well, suddenly crypto doesn't settle instantly anymore, right? And, and you know, what do you call a, a system that doesn't settle yeah. instantly? You know, TradFi, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll give you one example, right? One thing that, in my opinion, for example, does improve security is streaming, okay? Not, not to kind of, you know, talk about it super fluid, but if you think about it, um, if instead of sending you $1,000, I open a stream to you, which will transfer a thousand dollars over two days, right? That gives me a ton of time to uh, make sure that that is correct while still giving you the security that that payment is in fact happening, right? And wow. you know, I literally just came up with that, but I'm just saying there's better solutions and we should try and avoid uh, adopting the things that made TradFi work so badly, right? Uh, which yeah. obviously, you know, the delays in settlement, they're one example, chargebacks are another example, but also things like KYC and AML are another example, right? Those are patchwork yeah. solutions that don't actually solve any problems and adopting them in Web3 yeah. does not take us anywhere uh, because ultimately they slow down uh, technological um, solutions that could, you know, uh, solve the problem. I, I don't know if, if I'm making sense, but basically... What I'm trying to say is sense. new technology yeah. Yeah, means it. new solutions and any regulation that is prescriptive in the way solu in the way yeah. problems need to be solved ends up ruining the opportunity to solve actually solve the problems with a better techn technical solution. It reminds me heavily of what the EU has done at the moment in the Data Act where they have created a provision that says smart contracts need essentially a stop routine embedded in them such that at any moment in time the operator of the smart contract can halt all you know interactions with a smart contract basically making this concept of unstoppable you know i don't know finance unstoppable smart contracts completely yeah, yeah. void right where you're really thinking like how did you come up with that guys that's such a, it's a <laughs> typical typical regulator mentality right it's uh yeah. you have your yeah. you have your solution and your solution is obviously the best because we have it right we don't have a, we don't have <laughs> another one we have this one so but it doesn't apply yeah. to this new technology it doesn't have intermediaries how can we apply all this intermediary based uh, uh intermediary yeah. based solutions to a technology that doesn't have intermediaries well, yeah. obviously, we need to introduce intermediaries, right? <laughs> this is like the whole point was to avoid the intermediaries, right? I think from a legal perspective, you know, the problem is um, that, you know, every 
every contract has two phases. There is the phase of, you know, primary exchange of services, but then there is the second phase of, oh, well, the services rendered actually were flawed. And now I want some money back in what I paid for these services, things like this. And in a crypto system where everybody's sort of anonymous, you don't really know your counterparty. Um, how do you do this? Right. I think this is sort of a, a problem, uh, that is so far unsolved. And I think I've probably talked about that already back in 2017. It's like, how do you actually implement a system for parties of a contract to be able to claim, you know, their legal uh, the legal rights in, in case a contract doesn't perform as expected. Right. So I think that's a, that's a potential issue that is sort of framed. You can frame it as chargebacks and credit cards. Like, Hey, actually, mm -hmm. you know, my wallet was hacked. I didn't want to spend that money. Can I have it back? You know? Um, and I know on Twitter people are like, Hey, my NFTs were stolen. They are currently being listed at OpenSea. OpenSea, can you please stop? Uh, trading of this asset and then if you're lucky OpenSea stops it and then I, I've even seen it happen that sometimes people uh, buy NFTs that were stolen and give them back to the person that they were stolen from and these sort of random acts of kindness but that's not really a systemic solution right and the legal system at least had a solution for this um, and I think in crypto right now we're very heavily relying on this you know sovereignty narrative on this, um, you know, uh, instant settlement narrative, which is great if things work out as intended, but if they don't work out as intended, we have seen the crypto people also scream for lawyers and courts <laughs> to settle things. And then, you know, how yeah. do you do it? Right. So you can't have it both that's ways. True, I true. think that's sort of an open issue. Yeah. I, yeah. I think, uh, as I said, I, I don't think these aren't, I'm not saying these aren't problems. I'm just saying that yes. um, there are always better solutions. Francesco, thank you so much for being with us today. This was an extremely interesting conversation. Uh, some really good points raised. Uh, I wish you good luck with Superfluid. Um, I hope we see each other in the next bull market, happily integrating with each other and, um, you know, rocking, rocking the next generation of crypto applications. Thank you for being with us today. It was amazing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invite. And uh, I hope we can onboard the next uh, billion users together, hopefully on, on common ground and super fluid.